the fifth episode of the Gamers Experience. I'm your host, Phil Willis, aka JC Server, and this is episode number five. And today we are jumping in with one of my favorite game series of all times, the Gold Box Dungeon Dragons Adventures by SSL or Strategic Simulations Incorporated. Uh, and boy, I, I'm super, super excited to to jump into this today. And I've been going back and forth of exactly uh, how I'm going to present this. I've done four. Sh- uh, this will be the fifth show now. I'm starting to hit a stride with how I want this this show to go and fine tuning it here and there and tweaking it. Got a little bit bit of feedback from friends, which has been helping out as well. And uh, and and so hopefully some of that experience and stuff will come together with one of my favorite games of all time to make a really great show for you all. So, uh, boy, we start off talking about. Let me start off first of all talking about Advanced Dungeon Dragons. In case you haven't heard, uh, Dungeon Dragons is what we call a pen and paper role playing game. Normally, you sit around a table with some friends and you have dice, papers to keep track of lots and lots of numbers and stats. But the essence is that one of the people is a game master uh, or the dungeon master. His job is to start telling the story. He sets the stage. The other people in the on the round the table, they're the players, and they play the heroes. And uh, they'll make up characters following the rules of the game with the dungeon master's assistance. And those characters are playing roles within that story. So the dungeon master keeps the action going. He plays all the monsters. Uh, he role plays the NPCs in the towns. Uh, he's the one who's worked on a lot of the plot details. But the characters around the table are the stars of the show. They're the heroes, unless they're playing an evil campaign, in which case they're the villains. But for the most part, they're the heroes, and it's their job to save the day. It was only a matter of time in the 80s as video games were becoming more and more popular, uh, especially through the computer. It's only a matter of time before people start adapting. Uh, these role-playing game experiences in some way, shape, or form to the computer. And there are a lot of older examples of RPGs, such as the Wizardry series, the Ultima series, that you may have heard of uh, before. But you don't hear, I don't hear too much anyways, and I listen to podcasts and retro gaming all the time, but I don't hear that often about the Gold Box D&D games, which is surprising to me. Uh, while they they don't have any distinction as far as being the oldest or anything along those lines, they are they were earth shattering for their time in terms of their depth, their complexity, and uh, and and the stories that they brought to the table. Uh, for for that time, nowadays we'll we'll talk about and we'll see whether or not it holds up too well today. Um, the the series was so popular that they came out with a a grand total of nine games over the course of i want to say five years give or take and those are the those are oh it's over on this side (laughs) but this uh, that's the boxes that you see over here i just pulled them up on an image search on google and you got pictures of all nine games starting uh, off in the upper left corner i think that is whatever far away from me is we got pools of radiance followed by curse of the azure bonds seeker of the silver blades um, Pools of Darkness. That those first four games were quadrilogy. They told one continuous story, and one of the cool things was as you could take your characters from one game, pull them into the next, and pull them into the next, and they would their levels would just get higher and higher. You could create a new team at any point in time, of course. Then you go on to Champions and Kin, which is in the middle. Uh, Death Knights of Kryn and the Dark Queen of Kryn, which was its own trilogy set in a slightly different universe, but using the same game engine. And then finally you have Gateway of the Savage Frontier and Treasures of the Savage Frontier. I have not actually played those two games, but I have dabbled in them a little bit. And then by this point, the graphics and some of those things were getting a little bit better. But uh, overall, the games are pretty much running on the same engine from the first one all the way to the ninth one. You're getting the the same experience, just different stories, different levels, different characters, and to some extent, some different rules working underneath the hood, uh, like with class limitations and the such. So, um, my friend and I had, uh, my friend Rob and I, back in middle school, had played our fair share of uh, role playing, pen and paper role playing games, Dungeons and Dragons. We even had the books and everything. We did our best to run the games in the in the conditions there in Florida. We didn't exactly have lots of paper and lots of, um, we didn't have fancy figurines. We used our imaginations a lot uh, where the rules would call for something more tactical. 
But then one day, uh, my friend got the, one of these games on the Commodore 64 and, and popped it in and we played it. And, and oh my gosh, uh, you know, it was just, it's just, again, it was mind blowing. And we'll talk more about that as the game is playing. You can create, you create a party of up to six characters and there's no reason to create less. So you want six characters. What we would do is we would each pick three and we would hand the joystick back and forth during combat. And this is a turn-based combat system. So we would hand it back and forth and play our characters out and try not to die. Dying was very bad because if you died, you had to reload your save game. And I believe some of these would even exit you out all the way. And back in those days, loading games off a floppy disk took forever. You complain about loading times now, you have no idea. But this game was so much fun that we gladly waited for the loading times uh, to, to get to the next part of the adventure. One of the... Um, one of the well, well we'll we'll get into the clatter on just a minute um let me just give you some stats first uh so the game uh, the game that i'm looking at today that i'm going to be showing you today as the sample of the series is curse of the azurbons the second game the first game pull of radiance uh, it's a little bit harder to get into they implemented a number of improvements after learning some lessons with the first one and uh, and for which makes the curse of the azurbons and layer games much easier to play uh, or more convenient to play, I should say. Yeah, and the keys are a little bit more intuitive. When you go back to like Pools of Radiance, a lot of the keys are different, and it's just a, a little bit more of a learning curve. So you can start with Pools of Radiance. I usually start with Kirsty and Zerbons. The games were released, uh, started coming out the series back in 1989. Uh, this was again released by Strategic Simulations Incorporated, and it came, uh, these games would come out on the Amiga, Apple II, Atari ST, Commodore 64. MS-DOS, which later on I did get these games for my uh, TRS-80 computer, which was really cool. Uh, they also came out for Apple Macintosh and the NEC PC-9801. So these are tactical single-player role-playing game experiences. Um, Let's see what else we got here. So one one of one of the one of the more defining traits of these games were 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 the collateral, and I'll put it over here on the left next to me here. This is this is the instruction manual, Curse of the Azure Bonds, and they uh, it's going to be kind of hard to see the small text. Let me see if I can make it a little bit bigger. I'll make my head a little smaller. I have a big head, it tends to take up a lot of real estate space on screen heck i'll just i'll just make this very very big for the moment and we'll just hide my picture so you have the best chance to see this and we'll zoom in here but you, you have uh, you have lots and lots of information crammed into these books uh, you have uh, details uh, about the campaign uh, nice beautiful picture drawings here pencil drawings uh, and lots and lots of detail as far as the races and the classes and uh, how you can do multi-classing if you want. So all that information's in here. And you're going to want to read through this. I can't emphasize this enough. These games uh, do not have tutorials of any way, shape, or form inside of them. They simply didn't have the space to put them on there even if they wanted to. Uh, you will need to read through this stuff and, and understand it and read through it carefully to get the most out of the game. Hell, to even advance through the game. Because if you build... Uh, an unbalanced party. Let's say you want you, you want to just build all clerics. You will probably die and, and not be able to make it through the game. Uh, you will hit walls. So I've warned you. There's just certain things that each of the different classes bring to the table that you're going to need to help get you through uh, this game. So there's descriptions of all the spells, as we're kind of seeing here. We got descriptions with Crystal Azure bombs. You get to Bonds. Uh, you get up to fifth level magic user spells, for example. And then there's the statistics. Another thing you need to pay a lot of attention to. There's a lot of numbers uh, going underneath the uh, the hood here. Some of this can be a little confusing when you don't have basic understanding of uh, Dungeons and Dragons, and it kind of helps. Like for example, one of the weird things about D and D is that the ability scores go from three to eighteen. Okay. Uh, but if you are a male, uh, you can get above uh, what, what would be considered above 18, and they put these uh, numbers in parentheses going from 0 to 100. 
Now, only human males can get 100, uh, indicated by the double zero there. Half-elf males can only go up to 90. Gnomes can only go up to 1850. Elves, 1875. And dwarves, 1899. Why? Just because. <laughs> they, they would later iron out a lot of these little idiosyncrasies in future iterations of Dungeons & Dragons. Uh, they got rid of the little percent numbers, for example, on strength, and just let them go up to 19, 20, 21. But, uh, and you can actually get a 19 or 20 strength and bypass those percentages altogether. But, uh, yeah, uh, but, the, but for some reason they did 18 in percentages afterwards just because. Here's all the different weapons and how much damage they do, depending on the size uh, of, the, uh, of the creature you're hitting and uh, things like that. So lots and lots of information for you here to take in. Different classes have different experience uh, tables and how much levels they get. Uh, lots of numbers for you to kind of crunch through and think through um, as you're looking through this. One of the uh, one of the things you got to pay particular attention to is this table right here on the left, the maximum level uh, level limits by race, class, and prime requisite. It, uh, it depending on what you're choosing, uh, you will hit a level uh, level cap in the the game. So, for example, a dwarf fighter right here says can only be a maximum of level 7. That means he can't go up to level 8 or 9 if his strength is 16 or less. If his strength is 18 plus, then he can go up to a whopping level 9. Now, the, the humans have unlimited ceiling on their levels, but it says here that the humans' top level in this game of Curse of the Zerbons is 12, so that, that's probably the maximum in the game, but dwarves can only get up to 9. Uh, so food for thought. Dwarves cannot be paladins at all. But you want to plan accordingly because um, in English, uh, I'll tell you, when I play Curse of the Zerbons or any of the ones in this quadrilogy, I generally just go for all humans because, yeah, limitations. The only exception, I think, is like you can do a ha uh, The rogue seems to have a high level ceiling no matter what uh, race you're, you're picking. But I'll just go all human. And one of the things, if you're playing like uh, like Pools of Radiance, where the game only goes up to six level anyways, you may not even think about these restrictions, right? Because the highest level in the game anyways is level six. Uh, so unless you look at the future games, or you know D&D's rules, the old D&D's rules very well, you might accidentally build a party that's permanently gimped uh, with, the, with respect of what level it can get to. So a certain classes can only use certain armor and weapons. That's all detailed here as well. But yeah, there's a lot, a lot of information crammed into what appears to be a small instruction book. Uh, yeah. So, we also have this right here. This is the Adventure Journal. And we're going to, we, you know, when you play the game, you're going to want to have this guy handy, at least in PDF format. The disc could only hold so much space back in the days. So, they put a lot of the story information, the background information, inside of uh, of these uh, adventure journal books. As you're playing the game, it'll say, go ahead and read journal entry XYZ. Uh, back in the old days, we'd actually check them off just to um, just remember which ones we'd actually been through before. But those entries are, are right there for you to read. And it'll tell you, go read journal entry number 35. So that's where you'll find the map. This one has a map. Might be helpful later on. So, And then we have tavern tales, which you would pick up in, in the taverns. Some of those are true, and some of them are lies. Uh, oh, and hey, look. The novel is Zerbines. Uh, Azurbons. Let's try this again. <clears throat> Magical mystery in the realms. The novel of Zerbons finds Alias, a sword wielder of the realms, in an unfamiliar tavern with a design of mystical tattoos glowing eerily on her sword arm. The menace of these blue glyphs is soon evident. Aided by a southern mage and halfling bard and mute lizardman, Alias begins her quest for the creators of the tattoos that bind her destiny, which is essentially the storyline of the game as well. Um, and uh, so that's interesting. Yeah, basically this uh, this uh, converted to a paper module from the official D&D computer module from SSI, this adventure. Oh, that's the adventure book. Curse of the Year Bonds is an AD&D adventure module set in Forgotten Realms. Player characters wake up to find bizarre magical tattoos on their arms. It is up to the player characters to work through a wild adventure to get rid of their curse. So yeah, you can go and check out, hey, it's like, don't miss these exciting products from TSR. The novel, Azur Bonds, and the module, The Curse of the Azur Bonds, are both on sale now at a local hobby or bookstore. 
Hey, you know, our local bookstore nowadays is Amazon. So I wonder if we can find this. If we just go ahead and go up to Google here, Amazon.com, and we check out Curse of the Azure Mons. See if we can find ourselves a, a book here. Well, there's the game on five and a quarter floppy disk, no less, for 30 bucks. Huh, that's, that's pretty funny. What, what about the book? Oh, here we go. Azure Bonds, Kindle edition, $7.99. Yeah, so you can play the game and you can still read the book, and it's available uh, on the Kindle edition there. That is pretty cool and awesome. Well, hell, someone's selling the paperback for 43 cents plus shipping, I'm sure. That is pretty cool. Uh, it's got all three, apparently, right there. Awesome, awesome, awesome. So, let's dive into the game. I think it's it's good to dive into the game and show you show you what some of this game looks like, right? So we're gonna go ahead and open up our God Galaxy client. I'll go ahead and stick my little picture back on here somewhere. Now, uh, while we're waiting for this to update, I've done this before, and you know, with these old uh, old computer graphics uh, it can be a little tough with the camera so we're going to try to we're going to try to play this one by ear uh, unfortunately i didn't think to update god galaxy before recording this should only take a minute and while we're at it we wonder if we can now I'll wait for it to get done thinking really hard about it though but yeah we would stay up to late hours playing this game 3 and 4 a.m. in the morning it, it was just it was just so much fun it was a great escape after the dreary days of school and the such my Empire Earth background that background changes on a regular basis so you never know what you're gonna get and here we go right let's find Curse of the Azur Bonds and let's play away This is an advanced D&D computer product. Now, Curse of the Azure Bonds. Boom. I'm going to do a little I'm going to do a little camera setup here to make this easier for you guys to see. So we're going to take away the video feed from the monitor and see if we can just capture that game by itself for you there and then make it big. That seems to be the best way to experience it. And it'll cut me off just a tiny bit, but I'll just move the camera there so you don't need to see all my room. There we go, Curse of the Azure Bonds. We're ready to play. There's some copy protection here at the beginning. We used to have a wheel that you had to spin around and look up the characters. Uh, it was a pretty cool little wheel, and if you Google, you can find out more about the translation wheel copy protection. And I believe they, they, they got ripped out of here. You can put in any letter and it'll work. Or just press return. That'll work just fine. And we're ready to, to start a save game. Now, one of the cool things about this game is creating your own party. That's that's something that, you know, in a lot of games, they force you to use their pre-made characters in party. Boring. Here you can create your characters from uh, a number of classes. Uh, there is all the races here. And... To go up and down, by the way, you have to use the home and the end keys. I use the number keypad for this. I've just gotten used to it. And like I said, in these Forgotten Realm games, the first quadrilogy, eh, I don't. I just pretty much stick with human for for those leveling reasons I told you earlier. But later on, the the in the 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 Kryn series, it, it becomes much more feasible. The the limitations are relaxed a bit, so it's more feasible to do some of the other race combinations. And you got your gender, and that, you know, it's really funny. Uh, <laughs> so we've had big feminism movements nowadays to bring women in equality with man, which is great. Um, that's a whole other podcast or conversation one day. But what's really funny is back in the old original D&D &D games, they had the limitations of the attributes set on gender. So males could end up stronger than women. Nowadays... <laughs> you play even Dungeon Dragons on paper, unless you're playing one of the old editions, the maximum limit for men and women are the same, as long as they're the same race. Now, now hobbits or whatever aren't going to ever be as strong as, as human maximum level limits. Um, 
but if you're both playing human you both can have an 18 strength not so with the old one so if you're playing a fighter or anything along those lines that goes stabity stabity you want to seriously consider doing male because they have higher strength limitations and you have your different classes here your healer which is your cleric your fighter your magic user thief paladin and ranger paladin's kind of like your holy fire he gets a few cleric like abilities and then ranger is kind of like your magic user fighter hybrid uh, but I generally don't really mess with these two a whole whole lot uh, in these games I, I usually tend to stick with the, the basics I might throw a paladin in there you have the alignments uh, a rogue if you're playing a rogue he has to be some sort of neutral uh, I don't really put too too much thought in this I usually just play a bunch of good characters now you can the, you can roll your stats so I can hit yes to reroll my stats as you kind of see me doing here and I can just keep rerolling until I get the best that I can get uh, this simulates the tabletop rolling experience though it isn't quite nearly uh, as fun I'm not exactly sure what rolling rules that they're using because there's different ways to go about this normally you'd roll 3d6 and you just put the number straight down um, not really sure what they're doing here three this looks like it's more than 3d6 there's another way to roll that says roll 4d6 but drop the lowest die that might be what they're doing here and here you can see this guy uh, got an 18 with a 59 there in parentheses. So it shows you uh, it shows you their level. A bunch of statistics on here. Uh, I could spend 20 minutes just telling you about statistics, but the armor class right here is is how hard you are to hit. It starts off at 10 for the most part, and the better your armor, the lower it gets. It even goes into the negative numbers. To hit armor class zero is what you have to roll on 20 sided dice to hit something with an armor class of zero. So if something's pretty well armored, I have to roll a 14 to hit it. If it's unarmored like me, I would uh, have to roll only a 4. Because you would take the Thaco minus the armor class. Uh, encumbrance is how much weight I'm holding, I think. Uh, that's not the maximum. Maybe it's the maximum encumbrance. Hit points how much health I have. Damage is what I'm doing with the weapon I have equipped, which is none. So this is just my fist right here. One two-sided dice plus three. And then movement is how many squares I can move a turn. So we'll go ahead and keep uh, these stats here because we're going to show you a little trick here. Whoops. Well, it doesn't matter which stats we keep, and I'll tell you why in a minute. Uh, we put in our name. And and here's where you actually spend the most time, which is designing how your character looks. Now, you can change this at any point in the game, but this is his icon in battle. And, I mean, you can go for different heads. So we got all kinds of different headgear here. You can go for different weapons. It doesn't necessarily have to be the weapon he really... This, this guy looks like he's holding a dagger, but I could have a two-handed sword equipped. Uh, there's a disconnect there between what your character looks like and what you actually have equipped in the game, unless you go in and change his icon. We'll just keep this uh, for now, but you can change his skin color, his clothes color, so you can have all kinds of different looking characters. And then when you're ready, you save it. Add Bob to the party. And there's a lot of keyboard. There, there uh, it might be possible to use the mouse in this game. Uh, I'm just so used to using the keyboard to play it; it's much faster. Uh, I think in Pulse of Radiance you couldn't even use the the mouse if you wanted to, uh, so it may not be usable here. We can try. So here's a whole bunch of different options. We can create new characters. We can drop this character from the party. We can modify him, remove him from the party, which means to save him. Drop him means he's just gone forever. Um, but here's our fair one: modify uh, character. And we'll, by pressing M, we can now modify Bob. And we can go ahead and give him all maximum stats. So there is no difficulty setting in this game. But here's a game pro tip from Phil. If you want to play this game on what would be considered somewhat medium settings, you want to go ahead and max out all of the character stats to the maximum. You also want to make sure to go down here to the hit points and maximize that as well. Uh, that seems like it's cheating. And, and, and in a way, you know, on the pen and paper rules it is. But uh, this game also throws some really, really tough encounters at you that they didn't properly uh, play test against a, a an average party, I swear. Or you just got to be really lucky. So putting everything at 18s kind of just even some of those odds up. And D &D is a, old school D&D is a brutal game to begin with. So this just makes the game uh, to where you'll only struggle through some of the encounters namely the boss or the final encounters of some of the dungeons um if you want to play the game on hard because you're a better tactical role player 
then by all means, roll your stats the old-fashioned way. And if you just keep rerolling until you get something good, but you don't have perfect scores, you're now playing the game on basically a hard mode. And if you want to play it on super hard mode, just put your stats down even further. Or just play with four characters. So the difficulty is really based on how well you do or you don't do your party. So I just wanted to show you that. You can keep it and, and whatever. I'm going to go ahead and drop him. If I want to save him, I could just uh, remove him properly. But we'll go ahead and drop Bob forever. Yes, Bob bid you farewell. Because I've already got a, a game saved that I'm going to go ahead and, and play a little bit and show you. I think I got the right game here. Okay, so I the opening part of the game uh, shows you and your part of, of Curse of the Azure Bonds, and I won't go too deep into the story. I could be here all day. But as I mentioned in reading that introduction to the book, your party uh, wakes up uh, in an inn with strange bonds, uh, tattoos on their arms that can, can compel them and force them to do things they don't normally want to do. Early on in the game, you actually attack the princess's coach, and as a result, the town's guards are after you. You end up running away and uh, taking uh, refuge in a thieves' guild for a bit, and then they come underneath siege, and it just it gets really crazy. Like the book says, it gets kind of crazy. Um, once you get out of that city, the first uh, and you get through the fire knives uh, guild and the sewers and the such, the first sigil or tattoo disappears. But there's still like three or four others who are claiming to all be your masters. You don't want that, so you want to find ways to get rid of them. Once you get out of the city, you come up to this, you know, this overworld map right here. And this is where the game kind of becomes a little open-ended, which was also pretty cool for its time. You can go where you want to. And, uh, you know, you can, you can set, tell it here. I want to go Shadowdale or Teshwave, and you'll start walking your way there. And um, as you... See how I just decided to go this way down the river, and as your boat travels downstream, another craft comes alongside and forces you ashore. River pirates board and attack. So we get the we got ourselves a, a bit of a battle here, and this is where the tactical gameplay comes in. So here's my party of six people, uh, and Shirley here is a cleric. So um, because the icons are kind of big, and the resolution back in those days not very high they can only fit like uh, six characters here um, but if you hit aim and then manual you have freedom to move the mouse around and here we see we have a whole bunch of enemy soldiers on the other side they are armor class 4 uh, which is pretty pretty kind of tough and uh, they have 35 hit points in their sporting uh, broadswords not really sure if they can cross this river or not. That's, that's a good question there. That river kind of separates us, doesn't it? Well, we're going to find out. Now, since it's my... Oh, there's a little bridge right there. Is that above us? Yeah, that's above us. So they might come up there. We're going to... For now, we're just going to delay our turn. You can do that by hitting done and then delay. And that means you'll get to take your turn later on in the round. I'm going to do that for all my characters and see what these guys do. Apparently, they're attacking with crossbows. That's very cute. You might be getting a little bit of sound feedback there. I'll turn that down. There we go. So they're going to sit back there across the river and shoot their bows. Now, I've got bows and arrows too, but a um, bow and arrow fight doesn't really suit me very well. My guys are better with the sword up front. So we're going to work our way to this bridge. Yeah, you can't go through the water. Go figure. And we'll guard up here. These guys with the swords are my fighters. And these battles, these battles in this game can get pretty big. Um, as you can see here, we're pretty much outnumbered like two to one. Oh, you can walk across the river. Oh, oops. Learn something new every day. This is my magic user, uh, William. And if I go back over here, I can see like the furthest guy away is 17. So I can probably get a little bit closer. And uh, since they're all clustered together, I can cast one of my favorite spells, Fireball. And uh, you want to aim your Fireball to where you get a bunch of these guys in the screen here. If you press the center command, it centers the screen. And uh, usually a Fireball will hit everything except for the three squares in the corner 
on each side so you kind of like hmm what can uh, what can I do to get the most people here well, that's probably it right there so we'll go ahead and hit target a little fireball will blow up and do all kinds of damage in later games the, the graphics really do show a big fireball blowing up but I did some damage to all of them we're gonna keep trucking across the river here and uh, we won't get too close yet we'll let them come to us whoa wonder where my other guy went in relation to this dude where's he oh he's down there the only problem is like I said it's kind of a little zoomed out so it can be a little bit hard sometimes to tell where you are in relation to your party members can't go there maybe that why can't I go maybe it's a little tougher to go in the water it is saying that I'm kind of stuck there so he'll just get kind of stuck he can't go into the water huh but the other guys were going into the water that might be part of the instruction book I didn't read so they're shoot some crossbows and do a little more damage to us here luckily crossbows don't do too too much now here's the magic user again another spell he has a stinking cloud but it's it's pretty close range I'm gonna have to get a bit closer to start sneaking cloud them. Can't get my magic user too too close. Tends not to end well. No, see she can go. Oh, uh, I think it's like taking up extra squares to go into the water. I think that's the deal with it. Lots of arrows there. Uh, hate to get him all the way out here by himself but this is too much fun to cast the spell here if it's a little stinking cloud and these guys choking on it won't be able to move now sometimes they'll just say they're coughing which means they've made what's called a saving throw oh yeah water takes four squares to go through that's what it is and a saving throw means that they roll the dice and they only suffer part of the effects of the spell. Because they rolled well. Hmm. This poor guy here. This is my other cleric and uh, apparently he doesn't have enough squares to go through the water. So I think he's going to... Is he really encumbered or something? Yeah, he can only move three squares a turn. Boy, he's never going to get there. Uh, should have done something about that before. He's going to be moving slowly. So yeah, all these guys are coughing, and now my wizard can take his dagger and actually slay the helpless guy with more dagger. Uh, I mean, uh, dart, which is pretty funny. Here's another fighter. Take out another one of these guys, which is good because there's so many of them. Now some of the spells, this is old D&D, &D, and the spells really weren't balanced too well. Some spells are immeasurably more useful than others. And we're going to give you an example of that as soon as our clerics get kind of close here. In the meantime, we're going to keep slaughtering these guys. Here's this poor guy. He's going to be trucking forever. Sorry, dude. All right. Well, here's one cleric. And this is where it gets fun. So clerics, uh, clerics can pray, gives everybody bonuses. They can dispel magic effects. They can silence casters. But by far, the most useful spell between level 1 and 3 is hold person. Because uh, this thing can freeze a person in their tracks. And uh, it, it's bloody useful. And it, you get to target three people. And each one has to make what, a saving roll. And if they roll poorly, they get frozen. Just like that. So between... Oops. Walked right by that dude. If you walk by a guy, uh, he gets a free attack on you. And I think... One, two, three. We can put a stinking cloud right there. Wait. Manually. We got one helpless dude already. Need to get some more darts. Let's get rid of that helpless dude. 
are so cute firing their arrows. Now you can put your party on autopilot and everything will move very quickly. You can actually speed up the game if you want to. Um, I just got this set to where I can actually read what the hell's going on. But you can go to um, done and speed and you can make the game faster. So let's make it a little faster here and you'll see, you know, you'll see what I mean. And you see the messages are, are already clipping faster. I'm going to get our magic user back here. He's going to cast another one of those nice, powerful, odoriferous clouds. Ah, oh, he's too far away. Ah, I knew that spell was close range. Shoot, it's really close range. Da -da -do -do -do. And here's that cleric again, another whole person. One day this guy will join the fight. One day. I think I had him carry all the loot from earlier. That's the problem. The loot is where is holding him down. A lot of keyboard commands. That's the probably the one thing holding us back is just getting used to the keyboard commands. Once you get them down, the, the game moves pretty quickly. You can see the text is faster here. And it's so fast that I didn't even see how much damage I did there. So that's why I usually like to make... Oops, I hit delay. <laughs> He's got another spell, Magic Missile, that does a little bit of damage. Good for finishing off somebody who's kind of low on health. Huh. I'm almost there! By the time he gets there, the battle will be over. But, yeah, when you put the speed... Um, faster you can really get through these battles and lots of misses too at low levels another thing people aren't used to in playing tactical RPGs and we'll hold him and we'll hold him and we'll hold him instant death for them Hmm, quarterstaff. Just have our fighter go around, or our wizard go around, stab people with the quarterstaff. Now, I don't have um, a rogue in the game, but if you did, and one of your party members attacks somebody, the, uh, the rogue comes up on the other side and hits them from the other direction, flanks them essentially, you can do. Uh, double, triple, quadruple damage depending on the level. Now we're just getting through the rest of them. Sometimes they run, uh, their morale runs low and they start running away. Oh, he surrendered. And then we just need to have the rest of our people guard out and we'll say no to continue battle we receive experience points um you can take any of the things that they had like their crossbows and their bolts and stuff it's kind of worthless to us so if there's magical stuff in there you can do a detect magic spell to see what's really magical or not pretty sure none of those guys have magical stuff do you want to go back and claim treasure no the captain is impressed with your skill and invites you to sail with him at any time. And sometimes you'll get like little side missions and stuff from, from doing that stuff. Uh, we're now at Tisseltown. We're going to head and camp first because we've used a lot of spells. We took a little bit of, of pain and damage. So we're going to want to go ahead and set up camp. And here's the camp. Now, to get healed up, we can have the clerics. We can go into the clerics' um, uh, spell casting screen and we can cast Cure Light Wounds. Which cures between like 1 and 8 or something like that, hit points per casting, which could take a lot of time. That's how you have to do it in Pools of Radiance. You have to sit there and cast all those spells, slowly heal people up, rememorize, finish healing them up, rememorize. It's it's very tedious even if you're fast with the keyboard. Um, with, uh, with the newer ones, they put in this uh, fix command, which uh, allows you to automatically cast all your healing spells and rememorize them. Assuming that uh, you don't get interrupted during that time. Before we do that, though, we have to re we have to tell the game to rememorize some of the spells that we cast. So we cast a couple of our 
um, hold person spells. So we're going to go ahead and memorize those. And we uh, let's go down here. Magic and memorize. We memorize. We used up a couple stinking clouds. We used up a magic missile, and we used up a fireball. And then he used up a hold person. So if you rest here, it takes eight hours for my guys to get all those spells uh, memorized. Uh, so we can rest. We'll get all of our spells re-memorized. Now that we've got them rested, memorized, we want to go ahead and heal everybody. So what you want to do here is go to exit and go to fix. And that, boom, fixes everybody right up. It basically blows all of your healing spells and then automatically rest for however much time you need. Um, and now is always a good time to save the game. Save early, save often. Um, but yeah, we have choices. We can go into Telshwave. We can see what's there in the city. We can go to the inn. Welcome, adventurers, to the ruins of the Crescent Wave. All we have left is the common room, which we could have rested in the common room, which would probably be a little bit safer. When you rest out in the wilderness or you're resting in a dungeon like that, um, you always take a chance of something interrupting your rest. And uh, that can be really, really fun um, if it's really powerful. We can go to the sto store. We can buy. We can appraise uh, what magic gear we have. One of the interesting things about uh, Dungeon Dragons is that your stuff um, isn't automatically identified. So if I go in my view and I go in my items, I know this stuff is magical. I had cast the Detect Magic on a lot of this stuff earlier. But if this is a long story, but how is it magical? So to do that, I would have to pay to identify it. And it's a long sword. It's a plus one flame, flame tongue long sword, which is really, really nice. Um, that'll do extra fire damage. I want to put that on one of my fires. So I can go up to, let's say, Dave up here. And Dave is overloaded, so Dave can't have it. Uh. The, the interface isn't the most intuitive thing in the world, absolutely. Uh, it is definitely a matter of kind of getting used to it, and when you're not used to it, 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 can, take, uh, it can take you a while to figure some of this stuff out. So we'll go ahead and unequip our regular long sword, equip the flame, flame sword, flame tongue plus one. Our Thaco, actually I didn't even know, take note of it before, but if you see right here, our Thaco is 13. Two hit armor class, somebody with an armor class zero, I have to roll 13 on 20 sided dice, which is roughly what, a 30, 35% chance? So if I go into items, and equip this and now goes down to 12 plus I'm doing extra fire damage that's where the flame tongue comes in so that's pretty cool and my person's got a little better I've got gold, i got jewelry, i got gems so i got lots of money um, you go to the bar you're in a burnt out hulk of a once fine inn what will you do? have a drink what will you drink? some beer you're over here, tavern tail number 19 that's where those tavern tales from earlier come in and if I pull that guy up, uh, Tavern Tail 19, let's see if I can find it for you real quick. And it is on, I think it's on, do, 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 do. Give me one second here. And here we got Tavern Tail number 19. The city was devastated by troops from Zindel Keep. And now all the roads ro roads are heavily patrolled. So very good to know. Um, I don't think we'll have time to get into a dungeon, but when you're in a dungeon, it takes like a 3D, a 3D view, like a lot of games did back then, and it'll display in this little upper window here, and you'll use the arrow keys to move around. There is sort of an auto map uh, feature, but it's crude, and sometimes the map turns off, like you don't really know your surroundings, so it doesn't want to show you a map. It, it helped a lot of people back in the day to draw maps of it. It's grid-based, so it's not too hard to do. But uh, in the 21st century, where we all have less patience, uh, some people just go ahead and download help from the Wikipedia that already has all those uh, maps in place. So that is that is a brief overview of how the, the game works. The meat and potatoes, there was a lot of the combat system. There is a bit of fair bit of story going on as well as you try to figure out what's going on with those sigils. And this is not your your typical Final Fantasy save the world type of game. Uh, rather, it um, 
it, it's a little bit more adult oriented or mature in, in how it deals with themes and the such so uh, it, 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 to me it was pretty cool it was pretty immersive and it was a lot of fun to play and it was pretty cool how it would carry you would have this major kind of plot thing being carried from game to game to game and carrying your party forward was pretty neat so that is uh, Curse of the Azure Bonds um, I, I think that this game is still fun today you know tactical RPGs uh, are coming back there's a lot more of them coming out and I do enjoy them. Like we have Shadowrun and we have Wasteland 2. Um, there's just more and more uh, tactical games kind of coming out here and there. But I still like to go back and I like to play Curse of the Azurbons today. And if I have somebody who's really into tactical RPGs, I, I try to recommend it to them. It, it has been harder to get younger fans and friends into it because they take one look at the graphics and they balk. They don't even attempt to get into uh, into it. And even if I could get them past the graphics, I'll be the first one to admit that some of these rules are arbitrary and convoluted. They're not intuitive. You have to stop and read the book. You know, it'd be really funny. I, when I bought this on MS-DOS for my, my TRS-80, uh, I remember having the box in my hand in the car. A little bit of a fill story here. But the instruction book was like this thick, and I couldn't wait to read it. So I'm stuck at a red light, so I, 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 read, I was starting to read it. Somehow in being fascinated you know thick this thick instruction book while i'm at the red light my my foot came up a little bit too much off the brake and i slowly rear-ended the guy in front of me didn't do any damage at all we, we went in and drove on but i was like okay i gotta put this away you know <laughs> nowadays it happens when people are texting because they can't put the texting thing down but back in the day nerd phil was all about reading this book and i would take it home mom was like let me see this game you got She's like, that, that instruction book is huge. And I said, that's how you know it's a good game. And to this day, that's the running joke of my family. You know how good a game is by how thick its instruction book is. Unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, number one, games don't really have big, thick instruction books anymore. They teach you everything you need to know through the game. Uh, they're, they save money by not printing out the manuals. And or the games just simply aren't that complicated. Um sometimes it's because they oversimplify the games sometimes it's streamlining and it really is streamlining it um, but you don't always have those big thick uh, thick instruction books anymore the uh, you know i thought about whether i was going to show you more games in the series and such but because they all follow the basic form same basic formula there's not any major changes i'm not going to be doing another um, gamers experience on the gold box games per se but you can expect to see some gamers experiences on some of the other D and and e e and uh, forgotten realms games such as the eye of the beholders neverwinter nights uh, and the such they are on the schedule so we are going to see more of those but i'm not doing one specifically for champions and current death knights of cram which i had even more fun with those games than, than curse of the azar bonds the games for the most part get better as you go through it uh, you know some of them have some balancing issues some of them are going to have some points of frustration and some of them had just have random counter after random counter at one point i was going through this one temple one time and you'd run into encounter after encounter of dozens of priests and you're just i'm just thinking to myself how many hundreds of priests live in this temple do they ever run out that will happen sometimes but if you you get that with some of the other games that are out there if you can get past that there's a lot of great gameplay there there's a lot of customization the later games offer more and more flexibility um, and things that you can do in more mechanics which make that that core gameplay even deeper and i think you will find something to really really like there i did a little bit of searching there's still people playing these games to this day playing through multiple playthroughs playing through different ways there's a community out there so if you want to start playing these games and you want to engage that community uh you'll 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 find something to like there if you want something that's a little bit more modern but captures the spirit of this game I think uh, probably a good one I could recommend to you. It's on the tip of my tongue. It just depends on the system you have, but on the PC specifically, I mean, Shadowrun Returns is probably an easy suggestion uh, there to go and check out. I've been playing Hard West, which is also like a tactical RPG, um, but that doesn't quite hit the mark for me um, specifically. So might want to check that guy out. You can get these games on GOG as you see me you know playing them on GOG uh, through the GOG client and let me see if I can find y'all a price now they release these in kind of like bundles 
and that's uh, this. The first one is the Forgotten Realms, I believe it's called. The archives in his collection one, two, and three. They're each ten dollars each, and each one of them has uh, so many games from the collection. The collection number two has Curse of the Zervon, Secret Silver Plate, Pools of Darkness, uh, Gateways to Savage Frontier, Treasures of Savage Frontier. It has a lot of the games. One of the other ones I probably will do a separate uh, gamer's experience on Unlimited Adventures, which came out later, much later than the than the Gold Box nine games, but it was actually an editor that would let you make your own Gold Box adventures. So we'll talk more about that in the future. But yeah, you can pick up six of these games for for nine bucks. For thirty bucks, you can get all of them plus a lot of the the per uh, other D and D games that came out later on, like Eye of the Beholder. Um, and they're well worth it. Of course, you can always wait for a sale and get them even cheaper than that. The GOG client and the DOSBox setup work really, really well. I haven't really had any issues with it. You can speed it up. You can slow it. d and is an easy game to play anyways um, as far as speed goes because you can easily slow down the game from within the menu options. It isn't uh, freaking out because your clock speed is too high or anything along those lines. So I highly recommend you check it out. If you are a Gold Box fan, I'd love to hear from you. Leave some comments, you know, right down there below. You can always shoot me out a tweet. I'm at JC Servant. You can write me an email, jcservant at cyberlikecomics.com. Uh, you can check out the other Gamers Experience on the Gamers Experience playlist. You can check out my theological videos, which I've started picking back up again. Uh, that will also be down there. And... If you like hearing people talk about video games like this, go over to rpgamer.com. We have a lot of podcasts over there. There's one that my friend and I do called the RPG Backtrack. We're up to 160, and we talk about computer and console RPGs from the way back when all the way up through yesteryear. So you can go in and listen to us talk uh, in more in detail about some of your favorite role-playing games or maybe some of the ones that you missed. I think that's about it. I thank you so much for listening and getting through this with me. And you have a great day. Take care.